uh, we're going to have a formal um, introduction to the school this afternoon, a uh, formal welcome. Um, so we're going to get to the talks. And uh, our first talk is by John Chapman. Uh, and he's going to talk about motions of spirals in the complex Ginzburg-Landau equation. I'm wider. I'm all right. So I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to talk, and in particular for allowing me to talk about spirals instead of vortices, but they're very closely related, so I hope that's okay. Um, so this is the equation that I'm going to talk about, it's the complex Ginzburg-Landau equation, and it's one of the most uh, studied models in uh, physics, describes a whole host of things, uh, versions of this equation, and we'll hear throughout the week, I'm sure, about uh, superconductivity and fluids uh, and various other things. It also arises um, as the amplitude equation for spatial systems in the vicinity of a Hopf bifurcation, and so it's it's a, this sort of generic equation for studying pattern formation, uh, wave patterns in active media. And the sort of most famous example is the BZ reaction, but there are lots of other uh, examples as well. So it's sort of a generic amplitude equation. And in that case, psi would represent the amplitude and the phase of the wave trains that you see. Uh, so it's a very um, uh, interesting equation to look at. And I've got two parameters in it. I've got A and B here. So when they're real, um, so, uh, so those are real parameters. When they're equal, uh, the defect solutions are, are vortices. So that's the case that um, we'll hear about during the week. So particular interest are defect solutions, and those are uh, topologically stable solutions where you have a zero of this order parameter, uh, zero of this wave function psi, and, and you have a, the phase of psi will vary by uh, an integer multiple of 2 pi as you circle the defect. So if A is equal to B, if these two parameters are equal, uh, the constant phase lines are rays uh, emanating from the zero. So that means the phase of, uh, of the order parameter is basically the polar angle theta. And in that case, the solutions are known as vortices. If A is not equal to B, then the defect solutions are known as spirals, and the constant phase lines are no longer rays from the origin there. They're now Archimedean spirals. And in fact, the solution is not steady either, that the spiral rotates in time for the defect. So the phase is, uh, depends on theta and r, but also on time. So this rotation uh, of the phase and the time depends of the solution is a little bit of a, uh, can be inconvenient. And so it's often common to factor out the rotation. So if you make this transformation of variables, you can see I'm uh, writing psi as a e to the i omega t, so I'm factoring out the, the rotation of the spiral, so the, the time dependence of the phase, and writing the equation in terms of a new uh, lowercase psi. And when you do this, it, you sort of make these changes of variable in, uh, in x and t as well, and you end up, if I drop the primes, you end up with this as your new equation. And the advantage here is that uh, defect solutions are now steady solutions to this equation, so they're not time dependent anymore. Um, as you make this change, well, I've, I've now changed from A and B to Q and K. So Q and K are just related to, well, Q is just related to A and B, so those were the parameters in the original equation. And uh, K is related to both A, B, and this uh, rotation of the spiral omega. So in fact, omega is something that I don't know a priori. It's something that I have to solve for as part of the, the solution to the defect. And that means this uh, constant k is also unknown. So it now appears in the equation, but it's, uh, this is a bit like an eigenvalue for the equation. So k is determined as a function of q. It's not a free parameter. And k is known as the, as the asymptotic wave number because it's fairly easy to see that solutions uh, at infinity, the argument of, the, uh, of this uh, function psi looks like n phi, where phi is the polar angle, uh, plus or minus k times r. So this is the spiral at infinity, and k is the wave number of the spiral. Okay, so this is the, the form of the equation uh, that I'd like to look at. And so 
the vortex solution, the real Ginzburg lander, corresponds to Q is equal to zero, and uh, the spirals correspond to Q being non-zero. Okay, and so physical systems, uh, it's interesting to look at one spiral, but if you put this equation with, with sort of random initial data and solve it, you will get many spirals, you get many defect solutions. So often you're interested in, in not one, but lots of defects. And uh, the solution that you get, the pattern that you get is, can be quite complicated. And one way to understand it is to understand, well, what do the defects do? If I know where the defects move and where they are, then I've got a good idea of what the solution to that equation looks like. And so uh, what I'd like to do is see if I can work out, given an initial configuration of defects, what's the law of motion for the defects? How do they move? How do they interact with each other? And the solutions behave very differently depending on whether you're in the real Ginsburg-Landau case or the complex Ginsburg-Landau case. So when Q is equal to zero and A is equal to B, the wave number, this unknown uh, parameter in the equations turns out to be zero, and we know an awful lot about the equation. In fact, we'll hear an awful lot about the equation this week. Leo Bronzard is giving a mini course on it, uh, and I'm sure other people will talk about it as well. Um, so the case I'm going to be uh, interested in is where Q is non-zero but small. So I want, I'm going to consider the limit in which in Q is much less than one but, but uh, bigger than zero. And just to uh, simplify the exposition, I'm going to choose B is equal to zero. So that means that uh, I'm just going to have a D psi by DT here. I'm, I'm not going to have the mi one minus I B. Um, you can do everything that I'm going to talk about with the one minus I B in there. It's just how it's more uh, algebraically complicated. So. Okay, so uh, I want to tell you I'm going to get to a motion of spirals uh, towards the end. I want to give you two of the ingredients first. So the first thing I want to tell you about is just to remind you how the calculation goes for the real case uh, when Q is equal to zero. And uh, I'm just going to give you a flavor of the calculation. And then I'm going to look at the Q non-zero case, but for one steady spiral and show you how that goes. And then at the end, I'm going to try and show you what happens when you try to put them together. So if you've just got the real Ginsburg-Landau equation, uh, then I'm going to separate it into uh, modulus and phase, so I can write this uh, order parameter psi as f e to the i chi, so f and chi are real, and then the real and imaginary parts of this equation gives you this uh, coupled system. And the law of motion for well-separated vortices in this system goes back to John New in 1990. And... Uh, in fact, this analysis has now become the paradigm for which all motion of singularities seems to be done. So you, the way it works is you assume that the vortices are well separated. So you assume a separation, uh, I'm going to write it as 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is small. And then the solution to the equation ends up being divided into two regions. So you have an outer region uh, in which I'm going to scale distance on the vortex separation and then I see all the vortices separated in that outer region. And then near the vicinity of every vortex, you have an inner region where you have to scale back onto this length scale. And then in that inner region, you see the details of the vortex core. But, but you only see one vortex because you're looking locally near one of them. So you've got one region where you see all the vortices, but they just appear as defects. And then you've got another region in the vicinity of every vortex of each one where you see the details of that core, but you don't see any other vortex. And then it, when you match those two expansions together, uh, that gives you a law of motion for how each one moves. Effectively, the perturbation to the far field due to all the other guys influences this core in such a way that it makes it move, and you can calculate that law of motion through this inner and outer matched asymptotic expansion. And I'm not going to show you all the details of that, although the students who were here last week will have seen uh, this worked out for, uh, for the Ginsburg-Landau equations in superconductivity. The analysis is very similar. I'm just going to show you what the key equation is. And the key equation that determines motion, well, the, the motion happens, in this case, on a slow time scale. So time has to be rescaled with epsilon squared mu. Now, so the epsilon squared, you can see, when I go onto the outer length scale, 
that's going to bring an epsilon squared in front of this uh, Laplacian. And so to get the same epsilon squared in front of the time derivative, I need to scale time with epsilon squared. So that's where the epsilon squared comes from. Uh, the mu is sort of harder to motivate until you see the answer. So mu is another small parameter which uh, is going to be determined by doing all the matching. And it depends on epsilon. And it turns out to be logarithmically small in epsilon. So mu turns out to be 1 over log epsilon. Uh, and what that means is you sort of have a double expansion procedure. Uh, you expand in epsilon, but then you also got this small parameter mu. And epsilon is much less than any power of mu because mu is logarithmic. So the key outer equation when you do this rescaling ends up being uh, this heat equation in the, the, for, the, for the leading order phase of the order parameter. And the mu gets in here in front of the uh, time derivative. And this mu helps you solve this equation because now you can do an expansion of this, uh, the, this equation in terms of mu. So, you, I've, so I've already done an expansion in powers of epsilon, and this is the first term in epsilon. But then that, uh, uh, that function still depends on mu, so I can do another expansion in powers of mu. And what you find is that you get, at leading order in mu, you get the... Uh, the phases, so this is the local polar angle relative to, uh, to the jth vortex. So this is the sum of, of all the phases that you get for the individual uh, vortices. And then because of this time derivative, you get this correction term. And this is where the motion of the vortex comes in. So you get the velocity of the jth vortex is coming in here. And, and you can sort of see where the log epsilon comes from now because when you put this in... Uh, you put the phi here into this time derivative, so you've got the, it's, the reason this is not, uh, the derivative of this is not zero is because this phi is centered relative to the position of the vortex, and the vortex is moving. So you have this sort of convective derivative of phi, which is why you get this velocity in here. And when you integrate this, that's where you get the log in here. And this log r is the thing that ends up, uh, when I rescale near the vortex, that's going to give me a log epsilon and that log epsilon is cancelling with the 1 over log epsilon from the mu. So that's where this log epsilon comes from. So this, this double expansion procedure and this logarithmic dependence uh, of mu on epsilon, so it's useful in the sense that it allows you to solve this equation uh, through an expansion, it, but it can be a bit of a pain because matching log terms is typically... Uh, very complicated. Whenever you do match asymptotic expansions, if you've got log terms, you really have to match all the log terms at the same time. You can't match them one after the other. And it's sort of possible here, uh, it becomes much harder when Q is non-zero, and I'll show you how that happens. So that's the key equation in the outer region, and then the law of motion comes from a solvability condition on the, the equation near each vortex. So the way that goes is that you rescale near the elf vortex. Uh, so XL is the position of the elf vortex. So you rescale locally back onto my original length scale. And then uh, when you expand the equations locally, at leading order, you find you get exactly the same equations as you would do if the vortex was just stationary. And that just tells you the vortex is moving slowly enough that the core, the structure of the core is not deformed at leading order. It's a higher order correction term. So you can solve the leading order stationary equation. And then when you go to the first order correction, this is the equation that you get. And uh, so this operator on the right-hand side is uh, self-adjoint. And in fact, there's a non-zero solution to the homogeneous version of this equation because this is just the derivative of the equation I would get for psi naught. And that means that the derivatives of psi naught satisfy the, this linearized version of the equation. And so because there's a non-trivial solution to the linearized version by the Fredholm alternative, there's only a solution to this inhomogeneous equation uh, if I have a certain solvability condition satisfied. And you, when you work out what that solvability condition is, this, uh, this is what you get. Uh, where, so this uh, grab psi naught dot d, so that's the derivative of psi naught in the d direction, where d is sort of an arbitrary vector is a solution to this equation for any d. And so this is what you get integrating over an arbitrary ball in the plane. And if I take that uh, arbitrary region, if I take that region to be a ball of radius r, then you can 
reduce this down to this calculation here. So this is a known function in terms of the leading order solution, uh, uh, so the structure of a, a single steady vortex core. This is the velocity projected into a particular direction. Uh, D is arbitrary, so in fact I could, this equation would hold in the vectorial sense if I just get rid of D. And this is a, a function which is, uh, so I'm going to take the limit as R tends to infinity in this ball. So this ends up being the far field condition of the, of the first order correction to the phase locally. And that's what, you match that in from, from the outer region, and this, uh, this then tells you what the law of motion is. And when you do all that, this is what you get. So you get a law of motion which says that the, the elf vortex, the velocity of it, is in the... Uh, well, you take the gradient of this function g and then you rotate it by pi over 2, which is what this perpendicular sign means. And again, this g is an expansion in powers of this uh, logarithmically small function mu. So at leading order, you get, uh, you've got these 1 over r terms in the local e theta directions, and then you've got all the higher order correction terms. So... Uh, when you do this expansion, I didn't have to expand in mu in the inner region. I could sort of do that solvability condition without expanding in mu. Whereas in the outer region, I did have to expand in mu in order to generate this function g. So in fact, this equation is good to all orders in mu, it, but in order to evaluate g, I have to do the expansion. So this is the only way that the time that the mu expansion gets in. And if you go to leading order and you say, well, let me just keep the first term in mu, then you just have this term for, um, for grad G, and I can get rid of this term on the bottom here. And you find that the law of motion is uh, in the radial direction uh, proportional to the inverse of the separation of the centers. Uh, and it depends on both the, the winding number of the vortex that's moving and the winding numbers of, of the other vortices. So... Let me interpret that for if I've just got two vortices uh, and their positions, of they're both on the x-axis, so one is at x1 and one is at x2, then they move with a velocity which is proportional to one over uh, the, the separation, one over x1 minus x2. And the motion is such that uh, it's along the line of center, so the velocity is in the x-direction, and like vortices repel and opposites attract. So that's the uh, well-known law of motion for um, vortices in, in the real Ginzburg-Landau equation. All right, so what changes when Q is non-zero? So actually it gets a lot more complicated, even if Q is small. So I just want to show you what happens when, if you've just got a steady vortex solution uh, for small Q, and then I'll show you what happens with the law of motion. So I'm now going to consider the limit in which uh, Q is non-zero but small. And uh, the first goal that I want to do is just try and work out, can I determine what the asymptotic wave number is, even for a steady vortex? So as before, I'm going to look for uh, solutions F e to the i chi. And chi is going to be uh, n phi uh, locally. But now, uh, this, so for a vortex, this was identically true everywhere for a single vortex. Uh, now there's a radial dependence on chi, because in this case I get a spiral. Okay, so um, the first thing I'm going to do now is, is again introduce this outer region. Uh, so when I've got multiple spirals, this epsilon is going to be the distance, is going to be the inverse of the distance between them. Even for a single spiral, I, I need it. Um, and it's going to turn out to be what I'm calling the outer core radius is 1 over epsilon. And that's the region at which the phase lines switch from being um, essentially azimuthal to essentially radial. So I've got this spiral. So local near the origin, it's basically um, uh, there in the azimuthal direction. But eventually, the phase lines become, uh, the equal phase lines become radial. The other way around, actually. So locally, the constant phase lines are locally uh, start off being like rays, but eventually they end up 
uh, being like circles. And this is the, basically the distance at which that happens. Um, so you can think, I'm going to introduce epsilon, and I'm going to choose epsilon in such a way that this parameter alpha, which I don't know yet, is order one. Uh, so this is the parameter that appears in the equation. So alpha is just a re rewriting of, of k, this uh, eigenvalue. So you can now think of alpha as being the eigenvalue. Okay, so this time the key equation is the equation for the phase in the outer region, uh, exactly as it was for, for the vortex. But this time I've got a steady uh, uh, spiral. And so I've just got one steady spiral, but I still get an equation for the phase in the outer region because this is the radial dependence of this phase chi. So for a vortex, this just, uh, the solution would just be phi identically zero. If I put Q is zero, alpha is zero, I just get phi is zero. Uh, here I, I don't get that. And in fact, this equation um, is not so nice because it's nonlinear, which already is going to cause some problems because uh, I've got a phi prime squared here. Um, but it's nonlinear in a nice way in that it's a Riccati equation, so I can linearize it through a cole hopf transformation. So if I write phi as the log of, uh, of H naught and with the scaling of 1 over Q, then I end up with a linear equation for H naught. So uh, nonlinear was bad, but it's linearizable. That's good. So I can write down the solution to this equation, and then that allows me to write down the, the phase of the order parameter in the outer region, and you get this log of the modified Bessel function of complex arguments. So it's a sort of slightly strange function. Uh, but I still, this doesn't tell me what alpha is. So this is good. Uh, so far, this wave number alpha has not been determined. And to determine it, I need to match with the inner solution. And so the problem is now that, it, so it's going to turn out that, uh, that Q, so I've got two small parameters. I've got Q and I've got epsilon. Epsilon is uh, not known yet. It's chosen to make alpha order one. It's going to turn out that Q is logarithmic and epsilon, exactly as it was that mu is logarithmic and epsilon. And what that means is uh, that I'm going to need, when I do the expansion in the inner region and I look to see how does it look when I go back to the, the outer region, so I get this sort of uh, behavior. So you get a series expansion in powers of Q, Q is small, but each one has got log R in it. So I get a Q log R to some power. And the problem is that because Q is logarithmic and epsilon, I need to match all those terms with the outer region. And in fact, it's even slightly worse than that in that if I put R is uh, 1 over epsilon in order to match with, to, to get back onto the outer scale, that gives me a, a log epsilon here and if Q is order 1 over log epsilon, then all these terms are the same order. So the series rearranges when I go back to the outer region. So I sort of, I need to be able to sum this series in order to do the matching. And that's what makes this very complicated. Um, and the way to do that, that, so there is a technique that allows me to sum this series. And, and the way that that technique works is that uh, so, so far what I've done is I've, I've written the equation in terms of the inner variables, then I've solved it, and then to match I have to write it back in terms of the outer variables, and then re-expand it and compare expansions. And so, the way that I'm going to sum that series is to write the equations in terms of inner variables, to, uh, to expand in powers of epsilon, and then before I solve it, I'm going to write in terms of outer variables again. And, and that gives me an equation in terms of the outer variables, and then I solve it. So that seems a completely bizarre thing to do on the face of it. You, have, you write it in terms of inner variables, you expand it, you rewrite that in terms of outer variables, you expand it, you go around the houses. In fact, what I'm writing down is the equations for the outer limit of the leading order in a solution directly. So instead of solving and then expanding, I can expand and then solve. Um, so when Hagen does this procedure, and he thinks of it as a sort of middle region sitting in between the two expansions, but I think it's really just you're writing down the equation satisfied by the outer limit of the leading order in our expansion. And if you do that, it basically allows you to sum that series. Uh, so when you do the leading order outer limit of the leading order in our expansion, you get a similar equation for the phase. Uh, 
and it looks like this, then it's, it's almost exactly the same as the equation you get in the outer region, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, but again, it's a Riccati equation, so even though it's nonlinear, you can linearize it, and it turns into this linear equation, and then you can solve this equation, but it's now not Bessel functions, it's uh, powers of R, uh, complex powers of R, so you get R e to the I q n and R e to the minus I q n. And I've, it's, uh, I've got two coefficients that I have to determine, and I can determine those by comparing with that series expansion I had for small q. So there is a way of working out what these coefficients are. I get one relationship from comparing inwards, and I get one relationship by comparing outwards. So this is the, the technique that allows you to sum that inner expansion and compare all powers of q at the same time. Okay, so now you're in a position to match these two things together. And so the inner limit of the outer expansion, uh, remember that was this uh, uh, modified Bessel function, so that's got a, a logarithmic uh, singularity at leading order. And then the outer limit of the inner, I have to take the outer limit of this thing, so I've got to expand this for small epsilon. And when you do that, uh, this is the term you get at leading order. And then you see, well, actually, this term looks like 1 over Q, and this term is order 1, so these are not going to match unless this coefficient is 0. Or, or in particular, it has to be not identically 0, but it's got to be order Q at least. So that tells you the relationship between Q and epsilon, which is effectively, uh, which is needed in order to make alpha order 1. So this is telling you what is this uh, outer core radius of the spiral. And in order for this to be order Q, you need Q times n log epsilon to be pi over 2 plus, uh, plus a correction. So this is telling you that Q is logarithmically small in epsilon. And you know exactly, in fact, what the coefficient is, the scaling between Q and 1 over log epsilon. So once you choose, so that now uh, fix what epsilon is in terms of Q. So now I can carry on with the uh, matching procedure. And what you finally get when it boils down to it, is that you get a formula for what this coefficient alpha is, this unknown eigenvalue. And uh, it's turned out to be order one by construction, because that's what determined epsilon. And when you undo all the, the um, changes of variable and you go back to what is the asymptotic wave number as a function of Q, then this is the formula that you get. So you find that it's exponentially small in, in Q. So as Q goes to zero, K goes to zero exponentially. And this, is, uh, this agrees with what Hagen got. And you can work out what the, uh, the corresponding frequency of the oscillation of uh, the spiral is. So the, the outer core radius corresponds to that at which the isophase lines have effectively gone azimuthal from being radial near the origin. So, so I've now got to somehow put these two expansions together. So for the real Ginsburg-Landau equation, I, the inner expansion was nice and easy, but the outer expansion I had to expand in powers of mu to, uh, as the vortices were moving around, and I can only do one or two terms in that expansion. But, but I could still match them together because the inner one was nice and easy. For spirals, it's sort of the other way around. The outer expansion is nice and easy, but the inner expansion has got this whole uh, power series expansion in Q, which is logarithmic in epsilon, and I had to take all the terms in that expansion in order to match. So I had to do this resumming of the inner expansion uh, in order to get this answer. So on the one hand, I've got an easy outer but a hard inner. On the other hand, I've got a, an easy inner and a hard outer. So when I put them together, I sort of got a hard outer expansion and a hard inner expansion. And uh, again, you've got to use this resumming technique in order to get the things to match together. Um, so let me probably just said everything on this page. Let me show you briefly how that goes without giving you too many of the details. So, so the first thing I have to do is choose um, how far, what, choose the scaling between various parameters. So I have to decide what's the separation of spirals. So when I add vortices, there's only one relevant length scale for a single vortex, and that's the core radius. So it's straightforward to say, well, let me let them be separated uh, and distances which, which are much greater than the core radius so that the cores don't overlap, and then you can get the law of motion. Whereas for a spiral, I've got two relevant length scales. I've, got, I've still got the core radius where the order parameter dips down to its zero, 
But I've now got this, this uh, what I call outer core radius, which is the place at which the ISO phase lines change as well. So I've got to decide, are the spirals well separated by comparison to the inner core radius, the outer core radius? Am I in the very far field? And uh, so the, the, the first thing to try is, well, let's, let's try the distinguished limit in which the separation is the same as this outer core radius so that the, the cores don't overlap, but the interesting behavior in the phases happens on the same scale of the separation of vortices. So I'm going to choose epsilon to be this outer core radius, and then I've got to decide, well, mu and q, in that case, are both going to be logarithmic in epsilon. They're both going to be like 1 over log epsilon. So in the limit, mu over q is going to be finite, as mu and q both tend to 0. So I've now got three parameters that I'm expanding in, two which are logarithmically small in epsilon, and then epsilon itself. So I've said they're going to be separated by the same uh, order as the outer core radius. Um, so at this stage, because that uh, varies exponentially with the winding number, if you remember I had q, q is mod of n log epsilon, then I have to decide uh, what the winding number is. So it only makes sense to do this if all the winding numbers have got are the same in modulus. So I'm going to choose just plus or minus one winding numbers at this stage. So this is going to be a spiral separation of e to the two, uh, e to the pi over two q. That's the order. So uh, the first interesting thing is that as soon as I put multi, uh, multiple spirals down, this eigenfunction that I got, this uh, this k of, as a function of q is now, it's not the same. Uh, it depends on uh, the whole geometry of where all the spirals are. And that, in particular, that means it's not even constant anymore because as the spirals move about, the centers will move position and the eigenfunction will change. So this, uh, this eigenvalue K, uh, will, or equivalently alpha, is going to depend on the slow time, so the time scale for motion of these things. So I've got to keep in mind when I do the analysis that not only is k not determined, it's not even constant anymore. So, but you follow the same procedure um, as I've described even for, uh, for steady, for vortex uh, solutions, so for the real equation. So you rescale space with epsilon, you rescale time with mu epsilon squared, so that's what the equation becomes. And you go through the usual inner and outer expansion procedures and the key equation, as always, is the equation for the leaning order phase in the outer region. So this is a combination of the two equations that I've shown you so far. So the first two terms here, this is what we got for vortex solutions. And then the three on this side, this is the nonlinear equation that we got for a single spiral. Or we had the chi was only a function of uh, radius in that case. This is uh, the one that we got. So now I've got, put these together, I've now got a nonlinear equation for uh, the leading order phase in the outer region. So uh, that's a problem, but it is still a Riccati equation, so it is still linearizable by the cole hopf transformation. So I can write chi as, as 1 over q log h, and I get a linear equation for h. Um, so this is very tempting, because the, so the nice thing, the really nice thing about the vortex solutions is that you had a linear equation for the outer phase. And that meant if you had two vortices, you could just add this, the phase from this to the phase from that and add them together, and, and you'd got the solution. So it's, it's very tempting here to say, well, I've got now a linear equation, so that means I can just add the solutions for all the spirals, and I know what the, the phase is going to be. Uh, because with the nonlinear outer equation, it's not even clear how you're going to combine the phase from this equation and the, the phase from this spiral and the phase from that one. So you'd like to add the single spiral solutions together to find the solution to this equation H. Unfortunately, uh, because you've got polar angles in here, so you've got E to the, the QN phi, and uh, so this has got the right behavior locally. When you take the log of this function, that ends up giving you an N phi J in the chi, which is exactly the right uh, singularity that you need locally near each spiral. Unfortunately, when you add them all together and then you take the log, uh, 
uh, taking a log of a sum, they don't just plop out as the sum of the phases anymore. And so you end up with a multi-valued function for psi. And so, uh, so this is not the right solution to, it's the solution of this equation which has got the right behavior locally, but when you go back up to the psi up here, you find you've introduced multi-valuedness in psi. So it doesn't work. Um, so, so that's a bit of a sticking point. Because um, if you can't add together the solutions from multiple spirals, you sort of, s uh, there's nowhere to go. Um, and this is the reason that I need to take Q small. So if Q is small, then because this is e to the qn phi, the, the phi is only appearing as a sort of higher order correction. At leading order, this is just one, and then it's the q correction term where the phi comes in. So I can do this linearization and adding things together at leading order. And then if I'm careful, I can make sure that at first order, I introduce exactly what I need in terms of discontinuities to get everything to work again. And, and so Q being small saves the day. So you can use the Kolhoff transformation at leading order without difficulty, and then you just got to be careful that you don't do anything silly at first order. So to do that, I've got to expand uh, the phase in powers of Q in the outer region, and it, it starts at 1 over Q. So then you get... Uh, you get a nonlinear equation again, linearizable, uh, but for multi-valued spiral solutions, I can now just add the Bessel functions. Now it's a K naught because I'm taking the limit that Q goes to zero. And this depends on the distance of the spirals. Uh, so, the, so RJ is a local, it's a local distance to the J spiral, but it doesn't depend on the angles anymore, and so I've got no problem with multi-valued. Okay, it's, it depends on the R's, but not the phi's. So the weights here, uh, I don't know what they are, and they are going to be determined by, uh, by matching with the inner expansion, and they may be functions of time as well. Okay, so I've got to do the same thing. I've got uh, near each inner region, I've got a, a full expansion in powers of Q, and again, I've got to be able to sum that in order to match. So I'm going to use the same trick that I'm going to write that local expansion. Instead of solving and then expanding, I'm going to rewrite it in terms of the outer variables and then only then solve it. So, uh, so you get the leading order outer limit of the leading order in a phase, uh, and it satisfies this equation. So it's a, it's a reduced version of the equation that the outer solution satisfies. Again, it's nonlinear. Again, you can linearize it. Uh, and this time you just get Laplacian. And then the, the solution that I need in order to, to match, I, I need this chi to be uh, the winding number NL of the local spiral times the local polar angle plus some function only of R. And when you uh, plug all that in, you find that this, uh, <coughs> this function phi, well, so that's written in terms of H naught, and you find, again, you get these powers of R, so you get e to the R, uh, you get complex powers or imaginary powers of R, e, uh, R, e, R e, I to the QN. And, but this time, the, uh, the coefficients, uh, so last time they depended on Q, and I had to expand them and, and match them inwards. This time they might, may depend on time as well, so I just have to be a bit careful about that. But you can determine these by... Uh, by comparing with the inner expansion, the usual inner expansion, and also by comparing with the outer expansion. And so you come to the matching procedure, and you now got to say, so what happens locally? So locally, the outer solution, uh, chi, has again got, it looks like uh, log of H naught, so you've got this uh, 1 over Q log of log term. The... The leading order, the, so the limit again of this thing here, when you expand it, you again get this term which is too big. It's a one of a Q term. And so again, this thing has to be order Q exactly as it was for a stationary spiral. So again, you get this same relationship between Q and epsilon. You might have anticipated that that still holds. So if I, if I assume this to be true, so then this term disappears and I get to the next term, which will enable me to match uh, 
between that term and this term, then in the end, when you do all the, uh, all the matching, you get this, uh, this equation for, uh, that's come from the elf vortex. So you, this is the stuff you got from the inner, and then here's this sum of Bessel functions, one, one attached to each, uh, sorry, each spiral in the outer region. So when I had just a single spiral, this was an equation which gave me, which told me what alpha was. And I solved this equation for alpha, and that's how I got the asymptotic wave number. So this time, it's not the, the betas appear. That this is beta L, but here I've got all the other betas in here. So this time, it's not a single equation. It's a system of equations for the betas. But it's a system of equation. Uh, so these are the, the unknown weights of each of the spiral uh, solutions. But it's a homogeneous system of equations for beta, and I want to get a non-trivial solution. So the condition on the eigenvalue, the thing which determines alpha, is that the determinant of, of this uh, system should be zero. And so it's, so it's quite a complicated thing which determines what this alpha is. And then once you've got that, you can determine what all the weights are. And from that, you can see that the alpha is going to depend, because it depends on this distance, uh, the, the separation of the spirals, the eigenvalue, the, uh, the asymptotic wave number is going to change as the spirals move about slowly. And uh, so, so that's the asymptotic wave number. What about the law of motion? So you, you then get a very similar uh, thing at higher orders. Uh, I'm not going to show you any detail. Well, this is a, the, all the detail I'm going to show you, I think. So the, the key equation there is the first order equation for the, for the outer phase. And uh, this time it's a linear equation because whenever I'm expanding in powers of Q, the leading order equation can be nonlinear, but after that, it's all going to be linear. And it turns out that uh, the right thing to do here, sort of motivated by the fact that you knew the original thing uh, was Riccati, you can work out how to transform chi uh, to make this a nice, simple uh, Laplacian on the right-hand side. But because I'm not doing any logs or anything like that, everything is, uh, is single-valued. So everything is OK. And this solution, so this, is, this thing on the left is a little bit awkward, but you can solve this equation. Again, because it's a plus, you just get powers of r uh, and exponentials in theta. And so this is the solution to this equation, uh, where the v's here is the velocity of the elf vortex, so the two components of dx by dt. And then uh, when you match this, with the outer solution, you finally get the law of motion. And again, so you find the velocity of the L vortex is given by the perpendicular gradient of some function g, which, which has got contributions from each of the spirals. And, and g is just this thing which is the sum of the, these Bessel functions. Uh, alpha is now, remember, so, so this looks very simple, but don't forget alpha is determined by this determinant condition on the betas, and the betas are determined by solving that system of equations. So both alpha and beta also depend on the positions of all the spirals. So the, the dependence on the xj's is not just in here, but it's in there, and it's in here as well. Uh, so, it's, uh, so it's a strange system of equations. It's not clear exactly how it behaves. Um, Let me show you what two spirals do. So uh, you can go simulate the whole thing, but let me just show you for two spirals how it works. So let me again have a spiral at x1 and a spiral at x2. So they're both on the real axis. So then I can work out what this uh, um, gradient of g is. So I, it's the derivative of the Bessel function. Turns out if you've only got two spirals, so I, the condition for um, for the asymptotic wave number was that that system of equations was linearly dependent. If I've only got two, then that means they've got to be the same equation. And so that just tells me the two weights are equal when I've got two spirals. Uh, and so you can work out what alpha is in that case. And uh, when I use my expressions for mu and q, this is what the law of motion turns out to be. Uh, so, so this is sort of interesting. So it, it decays exponentially as x1 and x2 get well separated. So in the far field, uh, 
this is exponentially slow. Um, but this K naught prime grows like one over R, one over mod X two, uh, um, X two minus X one as you get local. So it, it gets str uh, stronger when they're close together. So it, this interpolates between the one over R local and the exponential, exponentially small when they're far away. The other thing which is weird about this is that, so this is the motion of the first spiral. So if you just look at, so which winding numbers does it depend on? So when I had two vortices, the, if they were the same winding number, then they repelled each other. If they were opposite winding numbers, they attracted each other. If I had fluid vortices, then the motion of this one wouldn't depend on its own orientation, its own winding number. It would only depend on what's the fluid generated by the other one because the, it's just advected with the fluid. So if this was a fluid vortex, the motion of X1 would only depend on the winding number of X2 of the second. But this one is the other way around. So the motion of this spiral only depends on its own winding number. It doesn't depend on the winding number of the other one, which is uh, sort of strange. So what you find here uh, is that the motion is also orthogonal to the line of centers. So it's in the y direction, and the spirals are both on the x-axis. So it's the opposite direction to how it would be for vortices, and it's uh, the sense of motion only depends on, the, on your winding number, not your friend's winding number. So that's a bit strange, because I'm doing the limit when Q is small, and I already showed you what happens when Q is zero. And you might have expected, when I take the limit as Q goes to zero, I get back to the answer for Q is equal to zero. But in fact, I don't. Uh, so if you take the limit as Q goes to zero, so the Bessel function just gives you one over separation. But the direction is completely wrong. This is, in, the motion is orthogonal to the line of centers, whereas for the Q equals zero case, it was along the line of centers. Um, and so the, so the limits are not... Uh, the Q equals zero case doesn't correspond to the limit as Q goes to zero. And what that says is there's something in between this expansion that I've done and just putting Q is zero for, from the beginning. And that's when the, the separation of spirals is smaller than this outer core radius. So I assume that the separation of spirals would such that Q is pi over two log epsilon. So this is, um, given Q, this is how I choose epsilon. And it turns out that if, if epsilon, if the separation is smaller than that, then you get a different law of motion. So there's another region to consider uh, in between this. So I said this was the distinguished limit. It is in the sense that you see this whole range of the Bessel function, where you get the one over R behavior locally and the exponentially small in the far field. But there's another uh, region inside this where they're still well separated, but not quite as far as this, where you get something different going on. And I'm not going to show you the details. I'm just going to show you the answer. So if they're separated by distance which is small compared to the outer core radius, then what that means is Q log epsilon is less than pi over 2. Okay, Because when Q log epsilon gets to be pi over 2, that's the definition of the outer core radius. So in that case, you get a different law of motion, which includes the, it's got a, uh, the azimuthal behavior and it's got a radial behavior. And uh, so this law of motion interpolates between the, the, the two that you get when either you're in the, the distinguished limit of, uh, of Q log epsilon being pi over two or when you put Q is zero. So if you take Q is zero uh, in this equation, then this term drops out because I've, I've got zero here and I've got a zero on the bottom here. So these two zeros, uh, uh, cancel with each other, and you get motion only in the radial direction. But if you, if you take Q log epsilon to be pi over 2, then this cos, uh, cos goes to 0, so you lose this term, and you only have the motion in the azimuthal direction. And you can see that, so there's a winding number NL appears at the frontier, and then this term gets an NJ. So this uh, separation, whether spirals separate or not, depends on both their winding numbers. But the direction of rotation when they're moving around each other only depends on your own winding number. So one of these terms has got an NJ in, and this one doesn't. So this is the, uh, the law of motion that sort of does the interpolation when you're 
So you're exponentially far away because Q is still uh, one over log epsilon, so epsilon is still e to the something over Q, but the something is less than pi over 2. And once you get to pi over 2, you then lose this term, and this term mod uh, changes into a Bessel function, and you finally get exponential decay. Yeah. So, yeah, well, so this is the summary of the results. So if you're in the, this distinguished limit, this is the law of motion. It's only uh, orthogonal to the line of centers. And the weights here are determined by solving this system of uh, homogeneous system of equations. And that's what determines the eigenvalue alpha. If you're uh, closer than that, then this is the law of motion that you get. And this one matches smoothly into New's law for Q goes to zero. And finally, I'll just show you, we did some numerical calculations. Um, so the dots here are simulations. And the two curves, are, so I've got two laws to, to do. One is the uh, Bessel function law uh, from the, uh, when you're at this distinguish or canonical separation. So that's this guy here. And then you've got this one where you're in this, uh, you're closer than that, which uh, is this guy here. And this is the rotation velocity. So for, for vortices, there's no rotation. And so it, in order to generate a sensible plot, I have to do some uniform composition of those two things. And so this is a multiplicative uh, composition. Uh, it's the dashed line here. And then the dots are numerical simulation. And because of this exponential dependence on Q, it's quite hard to get values of the parameters uh, where, where the asymptotics is still making sense. So I'm doing the limit in which Q is small and Q is only uh, 0.5, uh, but it doesn't seem to do too badly. And so that's the, uh, that's the separation, so that's the rotation, and this is the separation velocity. And uh, so again, I've now got the, um, you only get separation velocity if you're in this uh, middle region where you're not quite at the canonical thing. It goes to zero when you hit, uh, this, so this is Q is equal to pi over 2 log epsilon. And again, that doesn't do too badly. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you. So, so what's interesting is, uh, uh, so I think you would be in this middle region, not in the far field region. So previous asymptotic analysis of the problem have always said, right, you're in the far field. So you, in fact, they, this, the, the separation is not given by the Bessel function, only by the exponential decay of the Bessel function. For that to be true, you've got to be e to the pi over 2q away. So if q is small, that's a really long way for the far field. So I think this... Uh, in a region, it's much more relevant. Uh, so the, the last bit, the bit that I didn't show you the details of, and I only showed you the answer, is what you're going to see in practice, unless Q is really not very small. I mean, so we can get there. Uh, I forget what epsilon was here to, to get uh, if Q is 0 0.5, but epsilon is probably 10 to the minus 3 or something there. So, but, uh, but when you get Q any smaller than that, then it, uh, Epsilon just gets too big, which, which just means you're not in the far field. So you really do have to worry about this inner region and that you're, you're, you're within this outer core radius. You can't just say, well, they're well separated you have, because the core, outer core radius is really very far away. It's not so easy to see. It's just because you, you generate logs in that outer expansion, and in order for it to work, that's what tells you yeah, it's slow. It's, it, I mean, and also, the, the log is already uh, swamped by the epsilon squared. So it's, you already have this epsilon squared where that's the separation. So it's very hard to say what a log correction to that should be. <laughs> 
so, uh, so new was just introduced because I only, because you're doing with exponentials, I just needed it to, uh, that thing to be all to Q. I didn't need it to be zero. It sort of all comes out in the wash. So if you, if you undo your, I mean, I included new so that I could check that when I undid all the transformations, nothing depended on that anymore, that you could write it all in terms of the original primary variables, yeah. It's sort of related to the fact that, so Q is equal to pi over two over log epsilon, but you could then say plus a little bit, and that's what the sort of new is. So. I, I chose it equal to zero. And you, so minus one, minus one minus IB, yeah. And, that, and then I said B equal to zero. But I still, so B is zero, but A, I can go back, but, but A is not zero. So, so I choose this to be zero, but this A is not zero. And what that means is that when you do the, uh, the transformation, so this is zero, but now I've got this extra I over here on this side. And that's what... Uh, so So I didn't say, so if you include this B in here, it effectively rotates everything that I've got. So both those, so both the separation and the, and the rotation get rotated by another factor, which is this angle B. You, uh, you can do that, yes. Yeah. So if you, so if B was very large, then for, just for vortices, it would act like a fluid dynamical system. And then if you add this bit in, you get an extra bit, which is uh, uh, either separation or attraction. So it effectively rotates everything. So if you choose B to be large, you just rotate everything that I did by pi over two. And so, so, so I think you do get what you, uh, what you 